So, with that, I think uh, we're ready to get going. So, today's lecture is on economic economic growth. Uh, I can't spell today. Economic growth. and the environments. So we've kind of touched on these topics uh, briefly over the last few weeks. Um, I think it was sort of covered on the food production side and on the uh, libertarian case Walter Block made for uh, defending litterers and strip miners, etc. But we're just going to be talking about these uh, issues in a broader sense today. And that's going to include discussing these major indicators, economic indicators, uh, as you'll be learning, that come up in the news a lot, and you'll be able to be better, um, be better able to understand them uh, after this class, hopefully, and how you can uh, uh, analyze them and assess them and get better information out of them. So, what is economic growth? What is economic growth? Economic growth um, isn't just the manufacture of more stuff, okay? So that's, that's a big misconception people have, that economic growth is more stuff. But think of it this way. How many of you have a cell phone? And when you look at your cell phone, think about all the stuff that it does. It's obviously access to the internet, gives you access to a phone, gives you access to instant messaging, gives you access to televisions, movies, uh, radios, radio stations, maps, a notepad, all these other things. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you wanted to have access to all these things, you would have needed 30 times as much stuff. But it was because of economic growth that we were able to not use that much stuff and just come back to using a phone. Just We've whittled down all the stuff, all the different things, into just one, and that's one thing does all the things. That's part of economic growth, is that you're using your stuff more efficiently so that you get more out of each individual thing. You get more value per thing than you do from multiple things. What you could have been able to do with multiple things, now you can do with one thing. And people prefer the one thing over the multiple things. That's, that's a big part of economic growth. Economic growth, though, because it's subjective, we have to, well, there's been a lot of trends in trying to measure economic growth. And the most common way of measuring economic growth is GDP. This stands for Gross Domestic Product. Gross Domestic Product. This is all the stuff that a country produces uh, in a year. Okay? So the thing about GDP is that this is a what we call a flow. It's measured per year. So we have the GDP of um, 2012. We have the GDP of England in 2006. We have the GDP, we can estimate the GDP of France in the year 1905. Okay? We, uh, we have these um, we have these GDP statistics, even though the concept of GDP was invented only, uh, or was really started measuring only uh, uh, after the First World War, just before the Second World War. And GDP measures effectively uh, just a handful of broad categories. GDP is the spending on consumption, goods, plus investment goods plus government expenditures plus net 
exports. So we have, this is basically what GDP comes down to. It's just how much people are spending in a given year. And when we say that GDP goes up by whatever percent, we're, it's because we're measuring how much people have spent on consumption goods, that's food and bicycles and other things, investment goods, that's um, heavy machinery and all these things, government expenditures, that, that includes um, welfare transfers, and net exports, that's exports minus imports. And when we say GDP goes up, it could mean all these things went up. It could just mean one of these things went up a lot, everything else went down. It could just mean one of these things went up a lot, everything else uh, stayed the same. But GDP is made up of these four things. There was a lot of debate when it came to um, defining GDP, what should go into it. And there's a nice history of it that was, there's a book and a podcast that I'll link to. Um, that talked about whether war spending, uh, because GDP was first coming into prominence during the time of World War II, and governments were really pressuring um, the statisticians and the economists to include government spending on military equipment as part of GDP, even though the military equipment, the guns and the bombs and the planes and the ships, were being sent abroad to destroy things to and, and be destroyed themselves in the process. Uh, they wanted that to be included. The governments wanted that to be included in the GDP. So it's GDP itself is also a political uh, measurement, just like all measurements. There was something, um, we had a class a few weeks ago um, on, on measuring the effects of policy. There's one thing I wanted to uh, mention in that class, but I forgot. There's something called Goodhart's Law. Goodhart's law is the law that any measure that you seek after ceases to be a good measure. Any measure that you're after ceases to be a good measure. Any measure that you target ceases to be a good measure. And when politicians target GDP, just like they were doing during World War II, they, they were messing up. GDP was supposed to measure economic growth but politicians were trying to increase GDP by any means necessary. So they said, hey, let's throw in bombs and other destructive anti-growth things into the GDP in order to just to increase this made up number. So that made it a bad measure during World War II. So you'll see measures of GDP during World War II, GDP goes through the roof. But that's because it's counting, um, it's counting all these bombs and other destructive materials, and it's also not taking into account all the uh, all the sacrifices people were making in order to uh, to support the war effort. All the the rations that people were uh, doing, all the self sacrifice that doesn't go into GDP. So you got to be careful about GDP measures. Um, any questions on GDP before I move on? So let's let's walk in here. So well, we do not have a mod in this chat yet. Okay, let me just uh, make someone a mod. Orca penguin will be our mod for today. Orca, oops, mod, orca, penguin. So, what do we got? These, is GDP a useful measurement? GDP can be a useful measurement if you know how it's being con constructed, if you know what's going into it, how it's being measured, how all these individual components are being measured, uh, then it can be a useful indicator. Uh, for example, in Canada, we know typically they're pretty honest with how they measure GDP. So if you know that GDP is going up, that means generally people are getting better off. That's, you, you can get these general senses, but you have, to, um, you have to really understand how all these components are working. 
people um, in the in the early 2000s and uh, up until the late 2000s, there were questions being asked about China's GDP numbers. China was posting double-digit growth in their GDP. Most Western countries grow about two or three percent per year in their, in terms of GDP. China was saying that it was growing 10, 15 percent plus per year, and there were people questioning this data and they're saying, "Oh, can we really trust the Chinese government with these uh, numbers? Is it possible to be growing 15, 20 percent per year? What does that even mean?" So there was a guy named William Nordhaus who won the Nobel Prize. Um, for his work on the social cost of carbon uh, last year. But before he got famous doing that, he also got famous for uh, measuring economic growth in novel ways, not just in GDP, but for example, looking at the lights, looking at a country with satellite images during nighttime, seeing how much lighting there is. For example, it, um, I'll post a, a link to a picture. You know what? I'll just do it right now. So we've got North Korea at night. So let me just get this link open image. Excellent. Where is Twitch? So Everyone check out this, uh, this image of North Korea, South Korea, and China at night. And you can see all, the, all of South Korea is lit up, most of China is lit up. But then North Korea in between South Korea and China, especially Southern China, which is the most developed part, is virtually dark, completely dark. And that includes Pyongyang, the capital city, the biggest city, the, the most industrialized city of North Korea is still almost completely dark. And this was Nordhaus's idea to look at something like this as a measure of economic growth, that if people can afford electricity, then, uh, then they will have electricity and electricity is a sign of growth and pros prosperity and other positive things. So. Any other questions before we moved on? Is today's GDP a better representation of economic activity? Is today's GDP a better representation? Okay, so here's some things about GDP. So when you're measuring these components, there are some things called um, lagging indicators where it, you won't see the, the measurements. The change today won't show up until several weeks or months uh, ahead. So right now there were a lot of factories that started, right now everything's shut down, but a lot of factories were um, shutting people down ahead of time or um, uh, were making changes in their processes and the way their factory was running and their tooling and all these other things weeks ahead before shutting down today. And so you would have not, not noticed if you're looking at some weekly uh, uh, indicators for GDP. If you were looking at those, you would not have noticed any changes five weeks ago, and then suddenly everything just goes to zero. That might not have showed up, but you should have been aware. GDP is typically, um, the numbers are typically reported quarterly, so uh, once every three months. So people would have the GDP numbers for uh, the fourth quarter of 2019, which ended in December, and then it'll be some positive number. I think it was a uh, three uh, percent was what the number was in the United States in in uh, in the fourth quarter of 2019, and most people were thinking, oh, it's just going to keep growing like this in the next quarter, but of course we got Corona, and now it's likely going to be negative, so we can have a negative GDP. That means that um, we did not spend, the, the growth rate declined in, uh, in, these, in these components of GDP. So, let's move on now. So, we talked about GDP. Let's, I mentioned unemployment, so let's talk about that. 
So we have the employment rates. This is another indicator of, uh, of economic growth. And when it comes to employment, you have to be aware that what economists count as someone who's employed or unemployed might be different from how you consider it. You consider those terms. For economists, someone is only unemployed if they do not have a job and they are actively looking for a job. Okay? If they do not have a job and they're actively looking for a job, that's only when they're unemployed. If you have someone who doesn't have a job and has given up looking for work, then they're no longer considered employed or unemployed, sorry. In fact, so you have, so the employment rate is the number of people working, number of workers divided by the total working population. If somebody stops looking for work, economists remove them from the working population. The idea is most of the time, the reason someone isn't looking for work is because uh, they're about they're retired. They've, they've amassed so much money that they've retired or that they've, um, uh, that they've permanently injured themselves so they can't work anyway and they're probably making money uh, from charity or welfare, um, something like that. It's only been in recent years where we've had this, um, this, this phenomenon called the, they call it discouraged worker. The discouraged, uh, discouraged workers. These are workers who feel that the economic situation is so dim that they're not even bothering to look for work. So this is a new phenomenon or it's been discussed newly and they've been only measuring it um, only for the last few years relative to most of these other uh, indicators we'll be talking about. And these are people who are so uh, depressed, they are so pessimistic about their future job prospects, but they're not retired and they're not uh, disabled physically, uh, then they're not looking for work. So those are the discouraged workers. Um, the unemployment rates, we, so let's see what's happening. Are students who don't work to focus on school unemployed? Great question. They are not. If you're not looking for work, then you are not unemployed, per the uh, definition set up by economists and the statisticians who measure them. If you are applying to work actively, then you are, and you don't have a job, then you are unemployed. In fact, how they measure this usually is that they'll actually go and uh, survey people. And there are two ways of surveying. Uh, first of all, you can call up people and say, hey, have you applied for a job over the last four weeks? And people will say yes or no. Or they'll see uh, how many people have, been, have applied to unemployment or em they call it employment insurance. And to get employment insurance, uh, you have to be you have to demonstrate that you have been looking for work actively, that you're not just sitting around. That's part of the, uh, that's part of the, the conditions for, for employment insurance. It's not perfect. Uh, there are, of course, people who take advantage of any system, people who forget, people who lie, etc. But, um, but it's what people use, uh, it's what statisticians use. Let's see any other... Would a discouraged worker apply to people cautious about looking for a job because of COVID? Even if, so even if we have uh, this pandemic, there are people still applying for jobs. There's still some jobs available. For example, Walmart and Amazon uh, for their warehouses are hiring like crazy. In the United States, Walmart is hiring 300,000 people. I think Amazon is hiring 200,000 people. And there are lots of people applying for those jobs. Uh, so it's still possible to apply for jobs even during uh, depressions or, or pandemics, etc., quarantine. You can also apply for remote work. So there's still there's always going to be opportunities for jobs. Um, may not be enough jobs for everyone to accept, but if you're applying for jobs, then you are part of the, the working population, also called the labor force. Let me write that down, most popularly called the labor force labor force 
And if you are part of the labor force, then you can be counted as employed or unemployed. So, uh, but university students are technically looking for work in the future. Yeah, so once you graduate university and you don't have a job, but you're actively applying for jobs, then you will be part of the labor force, then you will be part of the employment or unemployment rate, whichever. So this is also a moment-to-moment -moment, uh, rate. So, that's economic growth and the employment rate. Let's also talk about something called uh, inflation. So we've discussed inflation before. Inflation has two really closely related meanings. The most common meaning, the, what they actually measure typically, when most people talk about inflation, including most economists, when they talk about inflation, they mean the increase in prices year over year. Okay. So we have, uh, so in Canada, our inflation rate is something like 2%. And that means prices today are higher than the 2% higher than they were last year. How they measure prices today is using something called the CPI. The CPI is the consumer price index. So those are, so remember this GDP, part of it is consumption goods or consumer goods. So the government tracks consumer goods, and what they'll say, they'll, they'll create a basket of consumer goods. And this will include food, rent, uh, electricity and utilities, um, leisure activities, gaming, uh, all these other different things. They'll create a basket, and by basket, they mean they'll have a, not only a list of all these prices, but they'll give them specific statistical weights. So they'll say, oh, a typical family spends 50% of their income on rent, for example, and 30% on groceries, and 10% on leisure, and then 10% on other. So then they'll make the basket based on those weights and based on those uh, goods, and then they'll, they'll track some of these goods. They'll go out to actual stores and uh, they'll get data from uh, actual businesses, and they'll get those prices, pricing data and then put them in their uh, little models. And then that's when, how they'll come up with their consumer price index. And the consumer price index, typically, they will set it to 100 at some random year. right? So they'll set it at 100 in, say, 2002. And so if, if it was 100 in 2002, and now it's 120 in 2020, or 121 in 2020, that means it prices have increased 21% today relative to 2002. But we typically don't look at prices going back that far. Um, we're typically mostly interested in year-over-year -year increases in inflation. That's, uh, that's the first definition, the most common definition of inflation. The old definition, the first definition of inflation that economists use, and not just economists, if you look at an old... Uh, an old version of Webster's Dictionary from like the 1800s, they will define inflation differently. They'll define inflation as the increase in the quantity of money. Okay? Inflation used to mean an increase in the quantity of money. And we talked about in our money chapter how an increase in the quantity of money is what causes prices in general to go up higher than they otherwise would have been. And that's actually one of the drawbacks of the CPI measurement is that it's measuring prices, this random basket of goods, and it's measuring how much those prices are going up. But it's not measuring what those prices would have been otherwise. So it's not telling us why those prices are going up. Are those prices going up because there's been increased demand, because there's been decreased supply, or is it because uh, increased um uh, a supply of money, right? So if imagine if all of us woke up tomorrow and our entire account balances were multiplied by 10. So if you had a hundred bucks in cash on you, all of a sudden you woke up and now it's a thousand bucks. 
And if somebody had a thousand bucks, now they have uh, ten thousand dollars, and etc. What do you think would happen to prices? Do you think generally they would stay the same, go up or go down? Right? I think if you have taken this class and if you think about that issue for a little bit, I think you would realize pretty quickly prices would just go up. They would go up 10 times to pretty much what they were before yesterday, right? Because if you were just spending, uh, if you have just 10 times as much money, now you can spend 10 times as much money but on the same amount of stuff. We don't have new stuff available. So you just have to spend more money on the same amount of stuff. And that's just going to bid up prices. And that's what's going to lead to an increase in the CPI, even though none of us are better off, really, and none of us are worse off. Just the prices for everything has gone up 10 times. Let's, let's I see a lot of activity in the chat. Let's see what's happening here. So will the inflation be greater than 2% because of all the government bailouts right now and the Fed decreasing the interest rates? So that's so the reason the Fed is decreasing interest rates and, and the, how they're decreasing the interest rate is by, uh, is by giving out a lot of money. Um, they're increasing the supply of money a lot by trillions of dollars. Their entire purpose is to increase, is to keep prices up. They do not want prices to come down. And the reason most economists today don't want prices to come down is because of something called the paradox of savings. The paradox of saving. And the paradox of saving goes like this. Imagine if, um, so we're in an economy, and if we all just start saving more, then we're not spending as much money. And if we're not spending as much money on goods and services, uh, a lot of businesses are going to have to close down. They don't have customers anymore. And when you're, if you're spending, if you're saving money, you're saving up for the future. And the idea is you want uh, lower prices in the future, etc. And you want better, uh, better things in the future. But the idea behind the paradox of saving is that when you increase your savings rate, you're actually hurting the economy by uh, taking more businesses out of business and, uh, and, and creating a, a recession and all these other things. That was the alleged paradox of saving until an economist named Friedrich Hayek came along and he solved the paradox of saving. And he said, when you save, it's true that some businesses that were um, purpose created to satisfy instant wants, those may no longer be in business today. But it's possible that they'll come back, that because of the savings, entrepreneurs will anticipate future demand, and so they'll invest in longer-term businesses that won't have goods and services ready today, but they'll be ready in a year or two years or five years later. And the way they'll finance this is by borrowing money from the savers at a positive interest rate. So people are saving money, and the, when, when you're saving cash, you're getting 0% interest, until an entrepreneur comes along, and he's convincing and charismatic, and he's got experience with uh, successful businesses before, and he says, lend me your money today, and I'll give you 5%, 10% back in five years. And that's what will uh, spur economic activity, not just today, it'll create um, It'll create uh, jobs and factories and other construction work today. And also it'll create work in five years and also create new goods and services in five years. The, the greatest counterexample for the alleged downward effects of the paradox of savings is with uh, consumer electronics. So I remember a time in the 90s where buying a one gigabyte computer cost about $3,000. One gigabyte hard drive computer. It was an IBM uh, one gigabyte hard drive. It, was, it had some sort of Intel processor that was measured in like kilohertz. Or, it, was, it was very, very slow and cheap and it would cost $3,000. And then the next year, that same computer cost $2,000 because there have been so many new computers coming out 
that, uh, that the old technology became cheaper. And once it became cheaper, then more people could buy it. And the idea isn't, it's true some people say, oh, everybody knows if you just hold off on buying consumer electronics and buying a TV today, you can get a better, cheaper one next year. But you'll eventually want a TV at some point. You'll eventually get tired of waiting and just say, okay, this is going to be good enough. Uh, you'll spend your money today, just even though you know you can get a better, cheaper deal in the future, because you need that deal today. So that was the issue of the paradox of savings. And what, uh, that's, that's a big impetus for why a lot of economists are still confused, I think, about the paradox of savings. And that's why they prefer a, uh, a higher inflation rate, a positive inflation rate, uh, because they say if we have a negative inflation rate, also called deflation, then we're going to have uh, this paradox of savings come up. People won't spend money. People won't um, uh, uh, invest, and etc. We'll get into a deeper depression. Uh, Friedrich Hayek said not so. So, any other questions on inflation before moving on? So, my workplace is closed and I need a job. I am actively looking for a new job and this would be an example of unemployment. True. But if I were able to not work and decided to stay unemployed until COVID-19 is over or whatnot, would that then would not be unemployment because I made the choice not to be looking for a job. That's right. If you're not looking for a job, even though, um, so the, the true economic definition is someone who, uh, someone is unemployed if they do not have a job, but they want one. But how do you measure somebody's want? And the way you measure in reality, somebody's want is by whether they are actively looking for a job. And if you're not sending out resumes, then that's the best, um, that's the best indication we have that you're not actively looking for work. And that's why we say that this, that situation you just described, uh, statistically, you would not be unemployed. You would be part, you would be out of the labor force altogether. So let's see any other questions. Fewer prices would increase, increase, shop owners would realize, okay, is that what causes issues when someone, some countries print too much money? So printing too much money, uh, so we go from inflation, when countries are printing too much money, we go from inflation to something called hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is what you get in countries that have runaway inflation, the Originally, the most uh, common example of hyperinflation was something called the Weimar Republic, which was basically what Germany was after the First World War. And the history there was, um, uh, after the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles uh, put all the blame on Germany. And they said, you guys have to pay back all of the damages that have occurred to France and all the other countries that you guys invaded. And there was lots of money that Germany did not have that money. So what they did was they just printed all the money that they owed. And that caused huge increases in prices where people were paying for uh, bread by wheelbarrows full of uh, cash. Just stacks and stacks of cash bringing that to the store in order to get some bread. Right? That was the original nightmare scenario. Fast forward to the 2000s, we get the situation in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe had a similar thing where um, uh, inflation got crazy out of hand, where people were needing huge stacks of cash in order to get uh, to buy anything, uh, and then at that at some point they just gave up on on uh, on paying cash for things. They reverted back to gold. We also have uh, in the current times we have uh, Venezuela experiencing huge uh, triple digit inflation rates right now, hyperinflation, where people are making bags and other jewelry out of, out of the currency. And when inflation gets out of hand in a lot of these countries, the first thing the governments try to do is that they just lop off zeros from, uh, from the currency. So, that you, so there are bills, there were like $100 trillion bills in Zimbabwe, $100 trillion. And they just lopped off 
three of the zeros or six of the zeros or whatever. And they said, okay, new money, it's going to be the same as the old money, but it's just going to be worth a million times as much. And it's, it, they've gotten out of, under control in Zimbabwe now, but uh, for several years it was really nasty. Um, Argentina, a much richer country, um, they've also experienced uh, very massive inflation rates um, uh, in the 90s. And there are stories where people were being paid twice a day. And as soon as they were being paid, they were rushing out to the store in order to just buy anything. So because the value of actual physical things uh, lasts longer than the value of the paper currency. So you would get paid twice a day. And as soon as you got paid, you ran outside just to buy anything your money could buy. And then you would try to barter with that later. So that was, uh, that was the situation. Let's, uh, let's keep going. What drives inflation when wages remain stagnant? It's the same thing. So people are getting money somehow. And wait, so if this, this idea that wages are stagnant, this is, uh, you, gotta, you gotta be careful with it. There's this myth that's wage, that wages have been stagnant. And in my view, that's a statistical trick. So when we talk about inflation, there's a, you have to be aware of this difference between nominal prices and real prices. Nominal versus real. Nominal is what you see printed on a store. So this jacket might be $100, and uh, that would be the nominal price. The real price would be the, the nominal price less inflation. So we have... Uh, so what one way of figuring out the real price is that they, they take the inflation rate and they take it back. So if this same jacket, if this exact same jacket was on sale back in 2002 and today it's worth $120, then I say the real price was, is $100. The nominal price is $120 or the real price is $100. So that would be one example of doing things, of making this distinction. And people will do the same thing with wages. And they'll say, okay, the real, so nominal wages have increased a lot. So it used to be if you were a professor, if you were a full professor at Princeton in the 40s, in the 1940s, your entire salary for the year was $2,000. That's, that wasn't a lot of money back then either, but it was enough to live off of for $2,000 and for a fancy professor. And you could, um, it was $2,000. Nominally, today, a professor at Princeton probably makes more than $200,000. But their purchasing power, that's the real price, the purchasing power. What can you actually buy with, how much stuff can you actually buy with your wages today versus how much stuff can you buy with your wages in, say, 1975? And think about all the stuff that you could buy with an hour's work today versus an hour's work in 1975. How many burgers you could buy with an hour work today versus an hour's work in 1975. How many cell phones you can buy? How many, uh, uh, you know, fancy microphone stands? These things have gotten cheaper in terms of the real number of hours you work. Even though the way people measure prices and wages, even though that may have been flat, uh, it, has to go, it has to have gone up because we've, everyone has so much more stuff now. Uh, not just more stuff physically, but more valuable stuff that does more things than it used to 30, 40, 50 years ago. So that's, that's the myth of stagnant wages. How can prices go up when wages are stagnant is an excellent question once you get this myth of stagnant wages out of your head. And the reason is this. When you increase the supply of money, not I mentioned earlier that imagine we all woke up uh, 10 times richer. When the supply of money actually increases in reality, it doesn't affect everyone equally simultaneously. It affects some people first. In this society, the central bank prints the money first, and they give it to who? They give it to other banks, who then loan it to other big businesses, who then loan it to other businesses, who then uh, spend money, etc. So that's why the price of some things can go up faster than others. But when you're in a situation where where money is increasing, the supply of money is increasing, all prices will gradually increase, 
but some faster than others, depending on who's getting the money first. How are we for time? Oh, it's already 2.20. So we're, we're last five minutes of class. So let's bring this all back to, um, to the environment. And the issue is when we're, we're measuring all these things, uh, one other thing that we should mention as a measurement is something called economic freedom. Economic freedom is, uh, is, is a measurement of how free you are, how much liberty you have to uh, take part in economic activity. And the most, and I'll um, send, some, uh, send a paper on this, the people who measure economic freedom also tend to measure uh, uh, the effects on the environment. So let's talk about the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had very little economic freedom, especially compared to the United States in the, in the 20th century. But which country do you think had more ecological waste, the Soviet Union or the United States? Your guess should be that the, it was the Soviet Union. They were so poor. Because they were poor, they had to spend more resources. They had to spend more actual stuff in order to get less valued goods and services. They had to burn down entire forests in order to, uh, uh, to get crop material because they couldn't afford fertilizer. Whereas in the United States, we had uh, artificial fertilizer and other technological innovations that required less waste. The richer you are, the less reason, the more you can do with fewer things, that's fewer waste. So that was, uh, that was today's lecture. Uh, let me just hang out a few minutes in the comments section. Let's see. Russians are richer than Americans, BTW. Well, show me the numbers. Uh, all the numbers I've seen indicate the other way around. And you can also look at immigration patterns, right? So you can see, as another indicator, we talked about lights at night. When you see two neighboring countries, how can you compare which country is better off than the other one? Uh, see which country are people fleeing out of into which uh, the other one. Are people fleeing from South Korea to get into North Korea? Or is it the other way around? Were people, were people fleeing from uh, East Germany to get into West Germany? Or was it the other way around? Most people tend to flee one country because things are not going so well in that place. And most people tend to go to a country where they think their future will be better. And historically, so far as we're aware of, people tend to try to get to richer, more economically free countries, more capitalistic countries than from uh, economically less free countries. That's just a historic fact. So what else do we have here? Can you talk about HDI, Human Development Index? So the Human Development Index, I am very suspicious of. Um, uh, it, I just don't think the, the measurements are, are as good because they tend to be more subjective. Um, uh, there's a big issue right now with, uh, with, with happiness surveys. You're asking people, how happy are you in your current situation? And you get some poor countries saying that they're very happy, etc. Um, if, if people are really so happy, so to me, as an economist, happiness means you're, that you're not looking to change. And the people who are, if, the, if you're happy, then you're not changing. And we're seeing lots of people trying to change in those countries. And people are, are changing right now. There's this myth that if you're at $70,000, you get optimally happy. But if you're happy, why are people trying to make more than $70,000? Why are people trying to make eighty, ninety, dollars $100,000? Why, why do people want promotions? This is all, um, this is all subjective, but as economists, we can't, we can't look into people's minds. We have to look at their actions. And their actions speak, in our opinions, they speak louder than the words. And if people say that they're happy, but they're trying to get out of the country, if they're trying to immigrate, then that's not adding up. So that's, uh, that's that. Let's look at another question. What's the worth of wealth if it's not making you happy, though? You're right. What's, if, if, it's, if wealth isn't making you happy, then it's not wealth. By definition, it's not wealth. The purpose of wealth, well, it's not the pur purpose of wealth. The reason you acquire wealth is because you think it's going to make you happy. If you're not happy with your wealth, you would be giving it away. But why aren't you giving it away? Probably because you think you would be less happy than if you didn't have the wealth. 
that's something to think about. Uh, any other countries? But don't richer countries produce more pollution? They, well, let's, what's the most polluting countries in the world right now? China and India. So is it because they are so rich? No. Some people say it's because they have so many people. I think it's a better explanation is because they have so many, uh, they, they're just not, uh, they're, they're not rich. They don't have, they can't afford the very efficient modes of, uh, of burning fuels and burning plastics and taking care of uh, business in clean ways. They just can't afford it. It's not because of the population. It's because of the, the stuff that they need to survive. They can't afford better, more efficient, less wasteful stuff. Let's see what else we've got. Uh, you mentioned that the richer USA created less pollution than the poor Soviet Union. I have heard that the richer countries produce far more pollution. See, that's, that's another thing. It's another variation of the same question. If you are... Uh, so think about the poorest individual in the world. A baby. A newborn baby is the poorest thing alive. Okay? A newborn baby doesn't have any wealth, doesn't have any social wealth, doesn't have any social capital, has nothing, doesn't even have clothes, it has nothing. How much waste can a newborn baby produce? Virtually nothing, right? How much waste do rich countries, a rich person produce? A lot more than a desperate poor person. Would you want to live like a baby? Would you want to live alone and, uh, and naked and hungry like a baby? Probably not, and helpless, and, uh, and all these other things. Not even be able to speak. That's another so sort of wealth. Being able to communicate is wealth. Babies don't have that. How much can they pollute? Nothing. So you, get a, you have to, there's, there's, a, there's an optimal level of pollution, right? And this is, the, the more poor countries, once you have a civilization that's trying to progress, Poor countries have to progress in less efficient ways, in less, in more wasteful ways than a baby, than a rich country. A rich country is progressing in more efficient, less wasteful ways than a poor country is progressing in more wasteful ways. Let's one last question. Uh... One last question. I don't see any. Okay, so I think uh, we're at 25 after. That was, uh, we'll call that for class for today, and uh, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thank you guys.